Now that we decided to put our focus on total factor productivity as the main source of business cycle fluctuations, let's go back to our simpler framework, assuming capital and labor supply to be inelastic. Remember the budget constraint for the household. Because of constant returns to scale and perfect competition, profits are zero in equilibrium and factor payments equal total output. Also, in the economy as a whole, the total value of bond holdings must be zero, given the closed economy assumption, since every household's bond holdings is some other household's liability. Finally, note that we assumed both bonds and capital to pay the same return, I. This comes directly from the no arbitrage condition. In other words, for both types of assets to exist in the economy, they must pay the same return and hence the interest rate equals net returns to capital holdings. Given this, we end up with the aggregate resource constraint for households, stating that net wealth created in the economy finances consumption and the change in households' capital holdings. So let's take a closer look now at the equilibrium business cycle dynamics in response to a positive shock to total factor productivity. First, we should see an increase in output. Since capital and labor are inelastic, it must be that an increase in TFP leads to an increase in overall output. What about real wages? If TFP goes up, so will the marginal product of labor. Since the equilibrium in labor market is given by equating the marginal product of labor to the real wage, then the real wage will increase. Real wages are therefore pro-cyclical. How is it in reality? Let's go back to the data we showed on the cyclicality behavior of Eurozone, real GDP and the real wage. The dark blue graph is the deviation of real GDP from its trend. The light blue graph is the deviation of the real wage rate from its trend. These deviations are measured in proportionate sense. The real wage is calculated by dividing wages and salaries for which data are available from the first quarter of 2000 by the number of employed workers and then adjusted by the price deflator for GDP. The data on GDP and wage rates are quarterly and seasonally adjusted. What we see here is that wage rates are indeed procyclical. They have a positive correlation with GDP, but are not as variable. A similar analysis can be made with respect to the real rental price of capital. Since this is equal to the marginal product of capital in equilibrium, an increase in total factor productivity will also lead to an increase in the real rental price of capital, making them pro-cyclical too. How does this prediction compare with the data? Pretty well. We present the data here, again in deviations from trend, and can see that the real rental price of capital is strongly pro-cyclical. Lastly, what about interest rates? Well, since the rental price of capital increases in response to an increase in total factor productivity, the no arbitrage condition will also imply that interest rates must rise as well. So real wages, real rental prices for capital and interest rates are all pro-cyclical in the equilibrium business cycle model. What about consumption and investment? Recall the aggregate budget constraint. Since capital and labor are fixed, the increase in TFP will lead to an increase in the right-hand side net income and therefore also the left-hand side consumption plus savings must rise as well. The increase in real income motivates households to raise current consumption and future consumption, an income effect. The increase in the interest rate or intertemporal substitution effect, however, creates incentives for households to reduce current consumption. These are two effects that are working in opposite directions on current consumption. The net change depends on whether the income effect is stronger or weaker than the intertemporal substitution effect. 
the more or less persistent is the shock in TFP, the stronger or weaker is the income effect relative to the substitution effect. TFP shocks, as we can see, tend to be relatively persistent. That is, if TFP is above its mean, it is more probable that it will remain like that than not next period. And therefore, it is expected that the marginal propensity to consume to be quite high. This means consumption is strongly procyclical. Is it really like this in the data? The answer is yes. As we can see, consumption and GDP in the Eurozone are strongly correlated, with consumption being a bit less volatile. This conforms neatly with our permanent income hypothesis, household smooth consumption relative to fluctuations in income. Notice also that unlike in our partial equilibrium exercise before, the TFP-led increase in household income is always accompanied by an increase in the interest rate. And therefore, the substitution effect will always be present. As a consequence, not all income is going to be consumed, and savings investment will also rise and are predicted to be procyclical as well. Again, this is a prediction that conforms with the reality. As we can see here, comparing Eurozone GDP with investment for the period between 1999 and 2015. Finally, what about labor supply? We have been assuming labor to be inelastic for simplicity. But let's assume now that households' labor supply respond to changes in economic conditions. So, if households supply more labor, they enjoy less leisure time, which we are now assuming they value. However, more labor means also more income and higher consumption. The optimal response of labor supply to changes in wages will, as with consumption before, involve substitution and income effects. If the household chooses to work one more hour and thereby have one less hour of leisure, the extra W over P of real wage income pays for WP more units of consumption. Therefore, the household can substitute one less hour of leisure for W over P, more units of consumption. If the real wage rate W over P rises, the household gets a better deal by working more because it gets more consumption for each extra hour worked. Since the deal is better, we predict that the household responds to a higher wage, W over P, by working more. This is the intra-temporal substitution effect of an increase in the wage rate on labor supply. However, a higher real wage means higher real wage income for the same number of hours worked. Households spend the extra income on consumption and are now able to afford also more leisure time. Hence, a higher real wage leads to a smaller quantity of labor supplied. A permanent increase in real wage rates results in large income effects. If the, lar if the change in years one real wage rate W over P1 is temporary, the income effect is small. Typically, we assume leisure to be a normal good, meaning that when its price increases, that is, the foregone wage rate, households will choose to decrease its quantity. This means that we typically assume the substitution effect to dominate the income effect. In this context, the impact of a positive TFP shock on labor supply is depicted here in this plot. The increase in TFP leads to a shift upwards of the labor demand schedule and a movement along the labor supply curve, which leads to an increase in total hours worked. Remember also that the cause for the increase in the real wage in this example was an increase in total factor productivity, leading to an increase in labor demand. But the same increase in total factor productivity also leads to a rise in the interest rate. This also leads to intertemporal substitution effects on leisure. If the interest rate rises, a unit of real wage income tomorrow decreases in present value, relative to a unit of real wage today. Hence, 
the intertemporal substitutional channel would imply that labor supply rises today relative to tomorrow. This adds up to the positive effect on labor supply from the intratemporal substitution effect and makes labor supply increase with TFP and output. How does it work in the data? Actually, this is a prediction that is also confirmed by the data. As we can see, employment is pro-cyclical, albeit less volatile than GDP.